Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to everyone. Uh, welcome to our SAMI session today. Our topic for SAMI session is frozen fever, to freeze or not to freeze. Uh, this uh, SAMI today will be delivered by Dr. Haidi Muhammad and Dr. Nurul Akmar Nusrul. Both are histopathologists from the Department of Pathology. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Haidi to deliver the talk, followed by Dr. Nurul. Hospital. So I'm very much honored that me and uh, my colleague Nurul Akmar have been given the opportunity to share with you uh, one aspect of uh, the work that we do in our lab here in this hospital. So um, we'll be talking about frozen sections and since uh, there's a more popular movie uh, with the name Frozen in it, we decided to take uh, Frozen as our theme. So. All right, this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'll start off with a bit of introduction of frozen section, and we'll be talking about um, a lot of different aspects, including the advantages and limitations of frozen sections, as well as some of our local statistics here in our hospital. And the second part of the presentation uh, will be delivered by my colleague, Nurul Akmar. We've decided to take a slightly different approach to this case presentation, whereby we'll be giving you uh, th uh, some theory first before we show you our cases. So just to start off, what is frozen sections actually? Uh, frozen sections is actually, uh, it falls under the big umbrella of intraoperative consultations where the pathologist guides the surgeon during surgical procedures. Um, intraoperative consultation not only includes frozen sections, but it also involves other things such as the cross examination of the samples sent to us, psychological tests, uh, frozen sections is also included, and even some rapid special stains. But all, of all these, of course, frozen sections is the most commonly employed method. Usually, it doesn't take long. Uh, if you send one piece of tissue, usually you can get a phone call from the pathology lab within, uh, half, uh, within half an hour, 30 minutes, more or less, depending on the complexity and the difficulty of the specimen. And usually, during, when we're doing a frozen section evaluation, the patient is in OT, still under anesthesia. The surgery isn't over yet. And after the frozen section report is conveyed to the surgeon, the surgery may resume or uh, all in all, frozen section is actually a method developed for rapid evaluation of tissue. And the main principle behind it is, we know that there's water in all types of tissue regardless of the density. So what we aim to do is to very quickly freeze the tissue so we can harden it. When the tissue is hard enough, we can make microscopic sections to evaluate the pathology within the tissue sample. So these are just some um, uh, definitions that I've managed to find. And you can see that it doesn't really give you a, a, a good picture of actually what we do uh, for frozen sections. So um, I'd just like to explain further how frozen sections are different from the routine processing of specimens that uh, we usually undertake. So for routine specimens, usually you have to take the specimen out and put it in formalin. So that's a fixation process. And formalin penetration of tissue occurs at a rate of one millimeter per hour. So it's a really slow process. So next, it comes to the lab, you get registered, and uh, our medical officers and along with us, we gross the specimen, we examine, we describe, and we sample the specimen. Next, uh, once we've sampled, we've done our surgical cut-up, uh, we'll have to subject uh, the specimen to processing. If your tissue is small, it's below 10 mm long, and it's not too bloody and it's well, and it's well fixed, we can process it straight away. If it's tiny, we have a rapid protocol which takes uh, just under four hours. Uh, however, for bigger tissue and uh, samples that are not urgent, it has to go in undernight processing, which takes 16 to 18 hours. So after completion of processing, we'll have to embed the tissue in paraffin wax. Initially in a liquid phase and it hardens, followed by uh, a short uh, period uh, on ice before we start sectioning. After we section the tissue, we have to give it color. Uh, and our routine stain is hematoxin and eosin. Subsequently, the tissue is mounted and, sub and sent to the pathologist for evaluation. So in comparison to frozen section, we don't have the fixation period. The specimen comes to us and it's draw straight away. 
There is no processing. We embed it straight away. After the grossing, we mount it straight away in the mounting media. It gets frozen and sectioned straight away. It's okay. stained without the processing uh, step either. However, at the end of the frozen section, after the result has been conveyed to the surgeon, we do drop the tissue in formalin. It goes through it goes through this process all over again for confirmation. Okay, so these are the common indications of intraoperative consultations, or otherwise uh, more affectionately called frozen sections. So we'll go through these. Okay, first of all, the main, the most common indication for frozen sections is essentially to establish a diagnosis that will influence the surgical procedure. And well, what we try to do during this period is to provide uh, pathologic information that will help the surgeon perform appropriate surgery as efficiently as possible. Okay, the most common example for this is of course the differentiate between the malignant and benign lesion that cannot otherwise be determined. Okay, uh, a study done in 1996 shows that up to one third uh, of frozen sections do have impact on the surgical management of patients. A common example that we have here is, of course, with our gynecological team, whereby when you have a ovarian tumor and, and, and it shows sort of like solid areas and cystic areas and you can't be sure. Uh, so we perform frozen section to provide some information to the surgeon as to how the surgery will be uh, will be will proceed. Will it be a simple soft hysterectomy, or will it be something more extensive, which involves taking out the uterus and um, both ovaries? So, moving on to our second indication, this is also a very common uh, reason why frozen sections are requested, is to evaluate margins of resection. Basically, when you're doing resection, you don't want to leave any tumor behind. So, this is the purpose. Uh, uh, in our setting, sometimes. We get a small piece of tissue whereby the surgeon has selected an area for us where he thinks that the tumor is, uh, uh, is no longer present. Well, at other times, we get the whole resection specimen and we have to examine and determine and sample uh, where the tumor is already cleared. So these are just some of the really common examples of those sections for this purpose that we get. For instance, the common bowel <coughs> margin in evaluation of and tumors, fat skin tumor resections, and the presence of ganglion cells in Hirschsprung disease and also for glosectomy margins. <coughs> okay, um, the third indication for frozen sections is to determine the adequacy of incisional biopsy specimens. We don't really get a lot of requests for this purpose because uh, the example of this is when you have a deep-seated margin that you, uh, uh, sorry, a deep-seated lesion that you think is a sarcoma. You know, usually all of the tissue above the muscle, the skin, the fat, Usually, there's a lot of uh, reactive changes that occur above the tumor before you actually hit the tumor. So the frozen section is actually to guide the surgeon that they have actually hit lesional tissue. Because sometimes the necrosis, the edema, the inflammation, the fibrosis surrounding the tumor might look like tumor grossing. Okay, um, the fourth indication is to stage malignant neoplasms intraoperatively. Usually before patients go to surgery, they would have been staged radiologically, and most of the time this is really accurate. But intraoperatively, sometimes unexpected findings might be, might be encountered, and frozen sections may be used to evaluate these lesions. A common uh, example that uh, occurs frequently with, uh, in our setting is essentially when our hepatobiliary surgeons go in for a Whipple's procedure, and suddenly they find either peritoneal nodules or liver nodules, and they want to know what is the nature of these nodules. Because you can have benign nodules, such as von Meinberg's complex, which a lot of people have, actually, and as well as malignant deposits. Uh, this is the fifth, uh, the fifth indication. And I've, ne uh, I've only been involved in this once, and that was not in this institution. Um, Usually, procuring fresh tissue for uh, microbiology, my, my, sorry, microbiological tests or more complex tests such as flow cytometry or molecular tests um, requires coordination with the pathology department. And in this case, we will have to sample fresh tissue because fixed tissue cannot be used for this purpose. And um, of course, the last indication is for pre-transplant pre assessment of donor organs. Um, in our center, well, in general, we do frozen sections for uh, donated uh, for donated livers and kidneys, whereby some morphological features that we can assess on frozen section really correlate uh, with how the graph is taken by the patient. So these are just some advantages of frozen sections, and basically, I've 
<coughs> many of these. But importantly, um, in case of sampling of tumor, uh, with, with the frozen sections report, we can give some indication to the surgeon you know, that you have to go deeper obviating a knee for a second uh, operation. And of course, there's all of the other obvious things. And I especially like number five, where we actually get to uh, collaborate closely with surgeons for patient management. Um, so I'd just like to share with everybody um, how requesting frozen sections are done. Different hospitals have different protocols, of course, but at least in our hospital, we very much like it if you could call us at least a day, be a day before a frozen section, and preferably by a member of your team who can actually discuss the case with us. Because I personally, I ask a lot of questions because uh, when I'm on call, I'll have to do the interpretations. So I think the gynae MO, um, uh, sorry, the gynae MOs, the gynae onco MOs, I don't think they like calling me up so much for frozen sections because I'm going to ask them everything, everything I know, and usually I end up having to speak to the Dr. Ushida and the Dr. Martin himself. So, um, okay, so once it's approved, uh, you'll have to fill in a frozen section booking form, and you fill it in and you send it to the histo lab so we know uh, what, how many cases uh, are going to come up the following day. So we, re we would really like it if you can call, give us a call when the patient is being pushed to OT or when there's a decision being made that you don't need frozen section at all because we're always waiting. Somebody's always waiting in the lab. Uh, okay, and another most important, uh, another important point uh, is that when you've obtained your specimen, just put it in a clean, dry container and label it appropriately. Please do not put any water, not even a drop of water and no fixatives at all. It's just the tissue. Okay, and last but not least, fill in your lab form, uh, do your order and manage specimen in e case, and send it to the lab straight away. So I know this isn't a really nice picture, but this is just to show you that that uh, frozen booking form does exist on the desktop. So all you have to do is go to lab orders there, that drop of blood, you click on that and you get uh, a lot of new folders, and you go to the Borang folder, and then after that you go to Borang Histopathology, and then they'll ask you whether you want internal or external. You go external, and then <coughs> you choose this form. Out of the three, it's only this one, the one that's sitting alone on the side here. So this is the frozen, uh, frozen section before form. And this is what the form looks like. It's a really simple form, but it's, uh, it gives us a lot of information. So um, sometimes we get calls for frozen sections that we think are not, uh, where well, the indication is a bit soft. So um, the thing is that we've, Given all the difficulties and limitations of frozen sections, so we are not so happy to carry out frozen that have no bear bearing on immediate management of the patient. Okay, um, there's a center not so far from here where the surgeons just pinch a bit of tissue and they just send it off to the lab and to see what the pathology says. So after uh, 45 minutes and we're trying to inform somebody, there's nobody left. In the OT, the patient has been closed and pushed off to recovery. So in those cases, of course, there's no real indication. It has the, obviously, the frozen section has no bearing uh, on the surgical management of the patient. So regardless of whatever reason that you're asking for frozen for, you should, we should at least meet these four criteria. First of all, especially with smaller specimens, breast, small breast lesions especially, when you're doing frozen section, you do not want to compromise the specimen. So for a 1cm lesion, if you're cutting it into half and sending it to frozen, uh, the other half might be damaged by hemorrhage, uh, edema, and inflammation. So that limits the subsequent assessment. Okay? And um, you have to submit enough tissue for us to have a good picture that is representative of the lesion. Because otherwise, if it's too small, you're going to get something like uh, minimal diagnostic material or non-representative tissue biopsy. Okay, and you want a reasonable chance of making a meaningful diagnosis, not just inflammation and fibrosis, if, um, if that's possible. And also, most importantly, there's a lot of artifact related with frozen section. So there, there's, there, there's always a small risk of providing misleading information. Um, so now I'd like to move on to the limitations of intraoperative evaluations. So what I'm showing here to you is basically a technical limitation. We have really poor morphology compared to our routine processing. Um, some, some of these artifacts are uh, unique to the freezing process, whereas some others are general artifacts. So um, knowing what these artifacts uh, for us who are interpreting the sections are really important so we can uh, exclude them from our assessment. So the usual artifacts are such as folded, folded sections, bad staining, and poor morphology. Um, whereas specific to the freeze artifacts are mostly related to the formation of ice crystals. Okay, 
Um, the picture that I'm showing you here on the side is actually uh, an example of intranuclear ice crystal formations. You can see inside the nucleus there's a big white hole here. Okay, this is an artifact of protein section. So, uh, one classical example uh, for request for protein section is to diagnose uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma. For your information, on histological grounds at least, to diagnose papillary thyroid carcinoma, regardless whether you have uh, papillary structures, the diagnosis is based on nucle uh, nuclear features. And one of the main features is intranuclear inclusions or intranuclear holes. So, um, if I were to read these two slides, I wouldn't be confident enough to make this distinction. You know, is, is this a papillary carcinoma? Is this the real thing? Or is this just an artifact? So, in essence, um, we don't use frozen sections to assess this lesion. And also, for follicular neoplasms of the thyroid gland, uh, frozen sections is essentially useless to differentiate an adenoma from a carcinoma because the, uh, a carcinoma is, base, uh, is basically the same as an adenoma, but it has vascular invasion and capsular invasion, and that is very difficult to find on frozen sections. So these are just a few other examples I'd like to share with you. This tissue, this is a piece of, this is tissue, this tissue is from kidney, and you can see these are proximal renal tubules. This is the permanent section that was fixed with formalin. You can see how you have ice bubbles all along these tubules compressing the tubules, squishing them together. Whereas in formalin, in formalin fixed uh, paraffin embedded sections, you don't have that artifact. And here, this is another uh, frozen section, again from kidney. You can see the nuclear detail is very fuzzy, and this is hard to read. And in some places, you lose the nucleus altogether. So these are alcohol fixed and uh, formalin fixed tissue where you get the <coughs> nuclear detail. Again, this is a piece of, t a piece of renal tissue. You, we cannot assess the stroma because of huge ice crystals. These holes represent ice crystals. And this tissue has been rendered entirely unreadable because there's nothing to look at. All of these slits that you see here are ice crystals. So, more limitations of frozen sections, sampling by the surgeon and pathologist. Sometimes it's really hard to differentiate uh, areas of necrosis and cellular degeneration, so that really impairs our assessment of the tissue. And again, I talked about capsular vascular invasion. And again, for ovarian teratomas, it's on a gro a grossly is almost impossible to pick up which areas are tumor, uh, which areas are immature components on a gross basis. So, ovarian teratomas are best processed in the usual manner. Okay, and again. Uh, as a pathologist, interpretative errors are, very, uh, are many. Because some tumors, they are very heterogeneous and they have different components. And during frozen section with limited sampling and the time constraint, we might sample one component but not the other. And again, a tumor shows many levels of differentiation. <coughs> and basically, the area of the sample that you sample is the area that you get at, that you report. And it might not be representative of the entire lesion. And of course, then there are very, very difficult cases where the morphology of the malignancy resembles normal or reactive processes. Classical one is, of course, signet ring cell carcinoma. On frozen section, these signet ring cells, they don't really cluster. They're usually singly dispersed, and they look exactly like macrophages. So OK, um, just to briefly go through what we have, the equipment that we require for running frozen sections. First of all, crossing station, a place to cross the tissue, and we need Everything has to be absolutely dry. Okay, secondly, is we need a cryostat. Basically, it's a cooling chamber, and the temperature can go as low as minus 40. And um, we have a microtome inside, and also a bleed holder as well. We require means to freeze the specimen. Our embedding media is actually a combination of polyvinyl alcohol and polyethylene glycol. And also, we need a, a means to uh, freeze the specimen of the specimen holder. And in this hospital, well, in most hospitals, we use pressurized tetrafluoroethylene. Uh, the specimen holder, we need a specimen holder, and also we need people to produce the slides, quality slides as well as pathologists. And usually we also have a uh, modified rapid stain. In our hospital, our protocol takes approximately four minutes, and also microscopes to assess the slides. So, yeah, let's talk about the accuracy of frozen section. Uh, in general, the literature reports an accuracy uh, of 90 to 98%, which is quite good, but that depends on the case types that they report. So large centers uh, have reported excellent uh, accuracy rates, but with, despite doing huge number of cases. I think this is Mayo Clinic. And 
there is one publication um, from year 2004, whereas one of the Malaysian public hospitals, they reported a, rate, a, a frozen section accuracy rate of 97.5% uh, over four years, covering 215 specimens. Um, in terms of uh, site, uh, the site specificity, CNS lesions, testicular tumors, and skin, skin malignancies, they will all yield reasonably good specificities. Um, for guiding cases, the accuracy reported uh, in uh, literature is quite good. However, whenever we're dealing with borderline uh, ovarian tumors, of course the difficulty is self-explanatory. Uh, so the accuracy drops to 78.6%. Uh, and when you were trying to assess tumor grade for endometrial carcinoma, I think the accuracy is still quite good. Um, thyroid lesions. Uh, is, uh, assessment of thyroid lesions is still fairly good. However, when you're trying to use frozen section di to differentiate follicular carcinomas from follicular <coughs> adenomas, the accuracy goes as low as 17%, which is why we don't do it anymore. So just to share with you some of the statistics, uh, these are, this is basically what we've gone through since 2013 and up to 25th of August. So you can see that our main indications are mainly related to diagnosis and margin. We do have a few transplant cases that have come through, and occasionally we get uh, we get uh, requests to st uh, to have a look at peritoneal nodules or liver nodules to stage uh, neoplasms. Okay. So in 2013, we had 43 cases. Um, three cases we had to drop three cases because they didn't quite tally with the paraffin sections. Accuracy, 93%. 2014, we had 51 cases. Uh, accuracy rate is 90%. We had to drop five cases here. And up to uh, Sunday, I think this was, uh, we've had 35 cases. We've had to drop two cases because of uncertainty. Uh, so we are sitting at 94.3% as of 25th of August. And, uh, the main department sending specimens for frozen section are basically peak surgical for assessment of Hirschsprung, resection margins, uh, gynae onco, hepatobiliary team, as well as occasionally we get um, the ORL team sending us tissue. So this is just a list of all of the cases that didn't quite make, uh, that weren't quite concordant or were rather inconclusive or less, or less concordant than uh, with the paraffin sections. So um, Dr. Nurul Akpa will present some of these cases uh, to you. Um, and this is across from 2014. Um, i just like to highlight one interesting case that you should uh, watch out for, and Dr. Nuru will be presenting this case to you, whereby we've had to um, look at an ovarian cyst uh, on frozen section, and it was reported as an epithelial tumor, it was difficult, had to await a neoplasioma, but when it came back in, uh, in permanent sections as well, there, as, as well as the resection specimen, it turned out to be stroma ovarii with microscopic capillary microcarcinoma. Okay. Um, in some situations, cytology is perhaps <coughs> more superior than frozen sections. Uh, and this can be done intraoperatively. Um, you can scrape the lesion and send us the tissue in a fresh situation, and we can make smears, or you can make smears yourself. And uh, this is especially useful for CNS tumors, for proliferative tumors, um, uh, yeah, where we can make touch imprints, smear or touch preparations to assess or to aid the frozen section. So in some centers, uh, a mini lab is actually uh, built in in OT or very near the OT for these purposes. And well, as far as my reading goes, it's of uh, a lot of benefit, but it's very, very expensive. And also in remote centers that require frozen section, public apology has proven to be very useful. So um, I'm at the end of my presentation, at least the first part. So I hope that I have demonstrated to you that frozen section is is actually a very powerful tool that provides uh, useful information to the surgeon. Um, however, it's uh, not so easy to interpret the slides because of all of the artifacts and all the technical difficulties. Um, sometimes other methods, need, uh, other methods such as cytology need to be considered for assessment of vision. And um, however, whatever it is, please just call, up, call us up and we can discuss the case to see what's most suitable uh, for the patient's benefit. So when in doubt, just give us a call. So um, are there any questions at all from the floor? This is what I look like when I first did my frozen section, my post-frozen section. I don't look like this anymore.